Good evening. A warm welcome to the last day of Phytopia, our first digital only exhibition. For those of you who are attending um, a talk and a program by us for the first time, we are Science Gallery Bengaluru, located otherwise in Bangalore, but a part of an international network of galleries with seven sibling galleries the world over. Phytopia was our third exhibition, or I should say is our third exhibition. Given the pandemic, we decided to hold this one only online. We have had absolutely fantastic partners and artists and contributors in this program. We are also, of course, organizing this particular talk in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center, whose support and warm and generous continuing support we hugely appreciate. Phytopia was organized to mark the International Year of Plant Health. And I am absolutely delighted to introduce Ralph Lopian, who's an agronomist and chair of the International Steering Committee for the International Year of, health, uh, Year of Plant Health. Following Ralph's presentation, we will also have Mahesh Rangarajan, environmental historian, who will be speaking about the le legacy of another environmentalist, Richard Grove, following Ralph's note. I would now like to invite Ra Ralph to address the audience. I'm grateful that you're able to join us today. Mr. Ralph Lopian holds a degree in agronomy from the University of Kassel in Germany and has specialized in plant protection. He has held various positions with the plant pathology department at the University of Helsinki, the National Plant Protection Service of Finland and the Secretariats of the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, as well as the International Plant Protection Convention. Ralph joined the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Finland in 1994 and was head of its plant protection section until 2001. He has been chair and delegate in numerous working groups of the European Union Commission and Council. He is the chair, as I already mentioned, of the Food and Agricultural Organization International Steering Committee for the International Year of Plant Health. Ralph, I welcome you and I'm really, really grateful that you're able to join us and we look forward to your presentation this evening on why at all bother having an international year for plant health. Over to you, Ralph. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you can hear and, and see me uh, uh, well. And I'm uh, honored to be present virtually at this, uh, at this uh, uh, event, of this closing event, and that I was invited to give a little talk uh, 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 at this event. Uh, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I have a small presentation per the event and I hope uh, you can see it. If not, yes. please give a shout. <laughs> uh, yes, the International Year of Plant Health and uh, perhaps uh, the main thing what we are trying to do is we are trying to keep our world green. And if you imagine a world without plants, this would be probably the first uh, picture which would come into your head. Uh, everything but green in this world. And when there's no plant, there's a world with no life because plants are responsible for life. They produce all the food we eat, either directly or indirectly. They produce all the oxygen. They give us shelter and they give us uh, fuel for transportation and burning. Plants is the basis of life on Earth. And a world without plants would be a world where there are no people, possibly such fellows here. But in fact, our plants are threatened and especially threatened from invasive exotic pests and diseases. Now, why did we want to have an International Year of Plant Health? We started the uh, initiative for an International Year of Plant Health already in 2015. But why did we want to have it? Because we have seen in recent years and decades uh, increased plant health risks and challenges. These risks have been increased through an uh, international trade, which has grown exponentially, through new pathways 
for pests and diseases to move between one and other countries or continents, for instance, through wooden packaging material. We have seen the distribution as disturbances and uh, weakening of ecosystems, which makes it much easier for pests and diseases to, to infect or infest plants. And in recent years, much, much more the climate change impacts. Uh, we have at the same time seen problems on, on national regulatory levels where national plant protection services uh, are losing resources, where we have less plant health research in universities and research institutes. We have, for instance, an extinction in taxonomic expertise because nobody trains anymore to be a taxonomist and we have less diagnostic services in the countries itself. And therefore we have made the International Year of Plant Health uh, as an effort to raise the public and the political awareness of plant health to help governments and the international community to address these issues. Plant health is actually contributing to a number of sustainable development goals of the United Nations. In particular, uh, the sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger, and uh, 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 13 climate action. However, there are also other sustainable develop, uh, development goals which are affected by plant health, which is decent work and eco economic growth, which is no poverty, responsible consumption and production, as well as life on land. I have now put two of those up to give you an example how plant health affects these sustainable development goals. The first one which I want to highlight is hunger and plant health. Global pests and diseases are responsible for up to 40% of losses in all food crops around the world. That's being worth 220 billion US dollars a year. The world population will increase to 10 billion by the year of 20, uh, 2050. And that means that agricultural production must rise by 60% to feed the world. Plant health measures can stop or slow the spread of pests, and international harmonized plant health measures help also to lower income economies to be protected against pests and diseases. Uh, here's a graph how the world population will look like and how it will grow. And you can see by 2050, uh, 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 we have about 10 billion people and uh, by the end of this uh, century we will have uh, over 11 billion people predicted to live on this planet. And here I have put a pest which has been recently spreading enormously throughout the world and which is causing food crisis and hunger uh, now already in Africa and perhaps also in large parts of Asia. And this is Spodoptera fogiperda, which is called the fall armyworm. It is a highly destructive pest. It's highly polyphagous. That means it can affect uh, almost 200 different plants. It makes multi-billion damages uh, in Africa alone. And it spreads very fast because it can fly 100 kilometers a night. <coughs> now, this pest was originally only in the Americas. It's a, it's a pest which is endemic to the Americas, to the tropical part of the Americas. However, in 2018, just barely three years ago, uh, it was introduced into Africa. It was introduced into Nigeria, and within a period of one year, it almost spread through the entirety of, uh, of Africa. Now, in 2019, there are only a handful of countries in Africa which are free. However, at the same time, it also spread from Africa to the Near East, first to Yemen, and from Yemen then further on to India. And now it can be found almost in the entirety of the Asian region. The same is also with, with hunger, how pests can affect hunger. Uh, climate change impacts on plant health through pests. 
because it changes the distribution of pests. And in the world's higher latitudes, there will be more pests and diseases. And in the central latitudes, uh, in the lower latitudes of the world, there will be much more severe pest outbreaks uh, and epidemics. And I have uh, an example for climate change and the impacts on plant health, and that is a forest pest, which is a mountain pine beetle, which is occurring in the North Americas. Uh, this pest kills 60 to 95 percent of all pine trees in a stand when it appears. It originates in the northwestern part of the United States, but because the temperatures in America in have uh, have been increasing year over year in Canada, it can be now almost found to the border of Alaska, and most of Canada is now infested. And I have put some pictures up of this pest. That is the pest in Canada. All the brown trees which you see there, they are all dead. Uh, and that as well. And when you have such large uh, areas of dead trees because of a pest which has infected them, then you have things like forest fires, which then uh, uh, devastate the environment completely. Uh, the former chair or the former director general of FAO, uh, Jose Graziano da Silva, said in 2017. There is no peace without tackling food security and elim eliminating hunger, and there will be no food without tackling climate change. And that is very, very important. And that uh, is also relevant for plant health. Plant health is an important tool to prevent hunger and to mitigate some effects of climate change. Effects of hunger and climate change will impact around the world and may cause environmental degradation, wars, economic crisis, and consequently, mass migration movements. Increased, increased global efforts to improve plant health may pas partially mitigate these above effects. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak at your event. I find it extremely useful that universities pick up these messages and work on plant health and to improve plant health. And uh, especially India with uh, uh, its large agriculture sector uh, needs and is also in the forefront of uh, looking after good plant health. And uh, I hope that my presentation has been informative and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ralph, for a wonderful talk and for helping our audiences understand why one would require um, to look at plant health carefully. And we, we, we've been lucky to also have the John Innes Center and some of their researchers allow us to delve more deeply into what plant health and concerns and research around plant health might even look like. So I encourage those of you who haven't had the chance yet to see the exhibition to please go have a look and you know, uh, join us in sharing this concern. So thank you very much again, Ralph, for taking the time to be with us this evening. Next up, we have, um, and I feel a twinge in my heart, uh, the last talk of Phytopia. And please allow me to introduce to you Mahesh Rangarajan, uh, who will be talking to us about green imperialism and after Richard Grove's legacy to the challenges of environmental history. With this, with this talk, we bring Phytopia to a close. So I would like to remind our audiences to please fill out the feedback, feedback form in the chat box and to put forth your questions to Mahesh there as well. I would like to invite Mahesh to speak and I want to thank him again for taking the time in his you know, madly busy schedule to be with us just, just like Ralph has been. Um, I allow me to introduce to you Mahesh, who is who's an old colleague um, and a dear friend, and uh, it is a privilege to have him with us this evening. He teaches history and environmental studies at Ashoka University. He has studied at the University of Delhi and Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He has taught at the University of Cornell, Jadavpur, and Delhi. 
but many of you will also remember him as having headed the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, which many of us researchers um, so long to visit at this moment when we are locked down. Fencing the Forest was his first book and Nature and Nation, the most recent. He has, of course, several books in between. His co-edited works include India's Environmental History, Nature, with a, Nature Without Borders, and At Nature's Edge. May I please invite you, Mahesh, to take over and uh, allow us um, to get a glimpse from you into the life and work of Richard Grove, a significantly important or well, that's probably not even the right phrasing, a person who in many ways helped lay the foundations of a field that many of us have inherited today, which has a very, very close relationship, of course, to forests and plants, but also to understanding the lives of forests and plants in the larger context of history. Over to you, Mahesh. Uh, thank you, uh, Janavi, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, join with the Science Gallery in Phytopia, and it's an even greater privilege and honor uh, to speak uh, in memory of uh, a dear friend, a colleague, and a very distinguished uh, scholar, uh, Richard Grove. It's uh, something I do with a heavy heart. Uh, it's uh, with a start I realized that 1995, the year of the publication of his book, Green Imperialism, and the founding of the journal Environment and History, which was published and continues to be published by White House Press, is 25 years ago. And uh, I was involved with the journal. I knew Richard uh, just a few months into my doctorate. He was uh, a figure of immense energy. It's evident in the life that he had, in the range of works uh, that he has left with us, and in the lives of so many people he touched. As perhaps uh, some may not be aware, in uh, late 2006, he met with an accident. He was not active uh, from then until uh, June 2020 in terms of scholarship. He was still often aware of his surroundings and very much alert to what was happening. But his contributions, in a sense, in the period before uh, the accident are so immense that they stand out. Uh, his uh, 1995 book was based on his doctoral work. And... Uh, it was published after a lot of time for a very fascinating reason. Uh, Richard is a person who'd love it if I told you the anecdote. He actually landed up at his doctoral uh, viva over an hour late because he'd been splashed over by mud. It had rained in Cambridge and he was dressed in a resplendent suit with a bow tie and uh, his gown and uh, he had to go to a shop, get changed and all that. And the examiner from the university was very angry. He refused to say anything. Uh, but the problem for Richard was somewhat more serious. His thesis was, we are told, over twice the permissible word length. Uh, doctoral students should not emulate him. He did something very brilliant. He put all the extra words into the footnotes and insisted, as per the university statutes, that they not be counted. But Richard, long before he had published his uh, thesis or he'd been awarded his thesis and published the book, was already well known. A year before that, in 1987, he had co-edited a book with Anderson, Conservation in Africa, people's problems practice, and it's striking over 30 years on how relevant that book is. The issues of conservation, a means to save nature, to secure for the future a larger natural and ecological heritage, to protect ecological systems from degradation, despoilation, destruction, can ever so often become an instrument of power. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, nature is often seen as an instrument of power of some men over other men or some men over other women and men. And this is something this book set out to do and did rather well. It brought together practitioners of conservation, hydrologists, biologists, ecologists, along with historians and anthropologists. And somewhere tucked away in it was a charming little essay, typically Richard wrote, on conservation in the Cape. Now Richard's thesis was a fascinating one. It was, as has been said by many people, counterintuitive. As you all know, in the late 1960s and somewhat earlier, the United States of America witnessed a great awakening to the issues of the environment uh, in the wake of the works of Rachel Carson and Barry Commoner. There was also a huge efflorescence of environmental history writing. America set out to discover how Americans had despoiled nature, but also how they had tried to conserve, preserve, or save it. Among these very fine scholars was uh, Donald Wooster, who in a very celebrated passage said that America gave the world two kinds of heritage modern capitalism, and the idea of wilderness. And for Worcester, wilderness stood opposed to the idea of capitalism. To preserve the wilderness was to rebel against capital. 
in different senses. And the titles of various American environmental historians books would show it to you. Changes in the land, beauty, health, and permanence. So this was supposed to be one of the great contributions of the United States to the wider world, the national parks, the forest service. Now historians uh, of Asia, principally Ram Goha, had long pointed out that uh, Jifford Pincho, who set up the US Forest Service, in his own book, Taking New Ground, said that he'd been inspired by Dietrich Brandis, who had set up the Forest Service in India. And in the world prior to Richard Rowe, the accepted orthodoxy was, at least among environmental historians, that forestry, irrigation, the creation of game laws was, in a sense, a kind of enlightened self-interest of the British, particularly in the late 19th century, to secure timber for the railways, even earlier, as early as 1807, to secure the teak reserves of Malabar for the Royal Navy. These areas had been set aside. I once had the occasion to sit next to a physicist at a dinner, and I was wondering what I'd talk to him about. I needn't have worried. I found, uh, for some reason, physicists are remarkably philosophically agile. And he turned to me and said, what's your research about? And I tried to tell him. He summed it up. He said, was it all imperial aggrandizement? Was there some enlightened self-interest beyond the narrow, selfish being? So at the end of the dinner, I found a card and wrote it down. And I think Richard and Richard Drobe's work pushed us in the latter direction. Richard Drobe did something remarkable. He took us away from a fixation on the United States, or for that matter, on the great old imperial powers, Britain, France, the Dutch Empire, the Spanish, and turned the idea of the diffusion of science, of scientific practice and scientific ideas on its head. In a nutshell, he argued that the island colonies, in his later work, he was to add a longer list, and of course, he chose a very beautiful place to begin the story, 1791, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where there was a law enacted to protect and preserve the tree wealth and the forests. And this was a time of extreme drought. Richard was to map the El Nino and show that in this period of unprecedented drought, the governing class of St. Vincent uh, drew on new ideas of desiccation and set out to protect the trees and plants and flowers and the forests in order to secure stable supplies of water. In his larger body of work, Grove was to show that in the Cape, and this was the paper I was referring to, there were early intimations of these connections between changing patterns of rainfall, the ability of the land to soak up and, and, uh, say, and uh, secure the water underground, and the quality of natural vegetation. So human use was beginning to be critiqued, and these critiques developed, interestingly, first in the island colonies, St. Helena in the South Atlantic, Mauritius, which of course is in the Indian Ocean, and eventually in Western and Southern India. St. Helena is of course very famous in history. It was the place of the exile of Napoleon. Uh, but for Richard Drobe, it was important because here there were not only efforts to protect the forests, but there was early concern among surgeon botanists of endangered species. The St. Helena redwood, for instance, was an object of protection. There was new concern among French uh, administrators such as Pierre Poivre who learned from the early extinction of the dodo in uh, uh, Mauritius and the solitaire in nearby Reunion, and set out to try and regulate not only the people of Mauritius, but even the white settlers. So this conflict between settler capitalism and the early incipient colonial polity or state is very important to, to grow because uh, he shows that unlike in France or Britain, where there were powerful landed interests, which were able to obviate regulation by the crown and at times by the French state. In the island colonies, it was possible for this early emerging scientific network of botanists who were in the various botanical gardens set up in different parts of these um, island colonies and mainland colonies, uh, Saharanpur, Kolkata, Tapuri, uh, site in Ceylon, a very important uh, garden in the Cape, one in Mauritius. These were places where there were early botanists who were also surgeons. This term requires explanation. In today's world, we think of botanists and surgeons as completely separate. We put them into different boxes. But in the early 19th century, particularly by the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, Grove was to show that there was a scientific literary uh, network that stretched across the oceans. One of the occasions in Cambridge, he uh, told me to keep very quiet, and I thought a mouse was going to come into the room. And he said, no, I'm going to let you into a secret. So we got into a 
lift, we got out on a floor, got into another lift, this happened two or three times, and we finally emerged in an enormous floor, which was full of ancient magazines. They weren't musty or dusty, they were very well kept. And he showed me, this is pre the internet being the rage across the world, uh, journals, transactions of the, it was the Journal of the Madras Literary Society, the Horticulture and Arboriculture Society of India, several other journals. And in these journals, there was an extensive exchange of observations about nature, about plants, trees, animals, fish. There were also speculations and discoveries and observations about the interconnections between organisms and their environment. What we today, and of course they didn't use the word then, would call ecology. Uh, the, the word ecology was of course to be coined in the late 19th century by a German, Ernest Haeckel. So what Grove was doing is something very important. He was looking for the roots of ecological thinking before the word had ever been invented. This is extraordinarily difficult for a historian to do. How do you find traces of an idea which as yet does not have a name? Sounds like Shakespeare? Well, he wasn't too far. There's a fascinating chapter in which Richard tries to show us that in The Tempest, the debate between Prospero and Caliban is about an island, and it's about the changes brought about by rapidly uh, shifting weather patterns that also concerns them when they try to make this island prosperous. So the prosperity of these early polities and states depended on a steady stream of land revenue. And land revenue in turn required adequate, constant supplies of water. There's a paper which Grove never published, which had a delightful title. It was called Surgeons, Forests, and Famine. So in other words, the establishment of the offices of conservator in Madras and in Bombay presidency in the early uh, part of the 19th century, in the 1850s, 1840s, uh, according to Grove, was less to do with timber supply and more to do with concern about climatic change. In 1851, five officials connected with the East India Company, among them very important man, Hugh Francis Clegon, gave a paper in the British Association for the Advancement of Science. It's a very important paper. Uh, it was about the relationship between tropical deforestation and global uh, uh, changes in the atmosphere. They didn't use the term global climatic change, but there were concerns about this. So Grove's argument is that in the 1840s and 50s, this idea of desiccation, that the land was being dried out, that water was becoming a more scarce resource or not was not available through the year, or that stream beds were drying up, or that rainfall patterns were changing. This was correlated to changing patterns of forest use and land use. Uh, in practice, of course, these uh, regulations bore down more heavily on the underprivileged. So the Kumri cultivators or shifting cultivators in Kurk were uh, to feel the brunt much more than the settlers. But there was an attempt, he argues, to make imperialism green. This was, as has been said by a recent uh, writer of an obituary, a rather mischievous title. To I the very idea that imperialism could be green looks to us like an oxymoron. We think of empires in terms of conquest, aggrandizement, um, extortion, uh, economic deprivation. And Grove was not objecting to any of those. He was only asking, uh, is, is the act or the process of colonialism not a monolith? Does it have within itself tensures, fissures, cracks, and tensions? Is the struggle for ideas as important as that, as the struggle between interests? There's no one answer to this, and I think it would be fair to say that in the succeeding generations of scholars and students, uh, there has been a lot of debate on these issues. Grove's journey, of course, continued. In 1998, uh, along with uh, Professor Deepak Kumar, he hosted, and Satpal Sangwan, uh, they hosted a very large uh, conference in Nistads in Delhi, and some years later, it was published as a book, Nature and the Orient. It looked at the environmental histories of South and Southeast Asia. The co-editor, uh, Vanita Damodaran, who was uh, his spouse, was also significant because she was participant in the founding of the journal and would be involved in another very large conference in 2003 in Sussex, where they set up the Center for World Environment History. These various conferences resulted in other volumes, one in 2011, the most recent published just a few months before Richard's very untimely demise in 2020, Commonwealth Forestry and Environmental History. I think two features stand out in these works. One, Richard Grove's constant attempt to bring to the fore scholars based in various countries, not only in Asia, 
but also in Africa. I want to emphasize this because uh, the promotion of scholarship in Africa, beyond South Africa, beyond some of the more uh, prosperous countries in sub-Saharan Africa, has always been a struggle because of conditions well beyond the control of the scholars or even the peoples of those uh, uh, countries. And Drove always made it a point to ensure that we tried and got as many scholars on board of these countries who were based in them. The other, of course, is that uh, the canvas had become much broader. By the time we look at Commonwealth forestry and environmental history, there's work on the various settler colonies, there's work on various parts of Southern Africa, various parts of South Asia, on Australia, on New Zealand. Grove, in that sense, was very early in terms of charting out a transnational kind of history. It was a history which was new. In the first editorial of Environment and History, he wrote about a conversation with Ranajit Guha, the very great subaltern historian. And Guha had told him that the subalternists had written about the stories of the subordinated, the underprivileged, the dominated. But it was time, Professor Guha told the young Richard Grove, to write a history of sticks and stones. Well, Grove did go beyond sticks and stones. He brought also uh, very uh, neglected ecologies and ecological systems to the center. And it seems to me these two broad themes of histories of nations which were earlier denied uh, history, uh, which were, where peoples were not in control of their past, and of ecologies whose obliteration has become an all too sad a fact of life. This was to remain an enduring feature in all of Richard Grove's work, from the future of forestry, which he published prior to his doctoral work, to the last book that he edited, co-edited, uh, which was uh, to be published uh, in the early 2000s. But I want to emphasize something else, which is that as almost over 20 years ago, in 97, he co-authored a book on El Nino. And uh, this had a fantastic title. It was called History and Crisis, Colonialism and Global Environmental History. Uh, this is a very significant book because he teamed up with someone who studied long-term cycles and climate and tried to correlate the El Nino, the ocean current in the Pacific, uh, with the larger changes uh, in society quality and economy in different countries and societies. You will recall that on St. Vincent and Grenadines, he correlated the occurrence of the El Nino with uh, the drought, and which led, of course, uh, which, which sparked, not led, but sparked the occasion for the enactment of an ordinance. I think it's very important that in terms of causal shifts, Grove was not arguing that the El Nino brought about ecological awareness. He was arguing that the El Nino gave the opportunity to create a sense of ecological awareness. Often people were unaware of the reasons for the drought, the reasons for these short uh, but very sharp shifts in climate. And it's significant in the case of El Nino that it is not driven through human action. This needs some emphasis at a time when we are quite rightly worried about global climate change, in which a large amount of the debate is about greenhouse gases, and quite rightly so. Uh, but there are longer shifts in the atmosphere, longer term shifts in ecological systems, which we ought not to neglect. I'd like here to emphasize two larger points, which I think have emerged over the last 20 to 25 years in the aftermath of the publication of Green Imperialism. The first is that there is much more work today on connected histories, which keeps ecology or environmental considerations much more at the center than before. I'll cite a few instances from South Asia and the Indian Ocean region, because I'm much more familiar with it. If we look at a very important uh, body of work of Thomas Trotman. So the 1830s and 40s, uh, there's a lot of turmoil in the areas which are now Afghanistan, and the horse routes get cut off. And around this time, horse supplies began from New South Wales. So we get this new category called the whalers. The 19th century is, of course, the time of a really extensive spread of British power. And by the late 19th century, they've consolidated power over most of India. And the 1870s, something very important happens, which is they bring legislation to protect a very large mega mammal, the elephant, 1873 in Madras, 1879 in the All India River. And this was not legislation brought to protect an endangered species. The worry was uh, not that the elephant would become extinct, but there would not be enough elephants to serve in the British Army, and much more significantly as timber elephants. So in the 19th century, there is a shift from horses uh, used for warfare to other forms of transport, which I'll come to in a minute, and from elephants which were used for warfare to elephants which were used for timber. Elephants continued to be used for warfare. Over 3,000 served in the Second World War. Their horses were to be used in mules in the First and in the Second World Wars, but their era was at an end. 
And to me, it's fascinating that 1860 is the year where Richard Grove's magnum opus comes to an end as a story, because it's the 1850s and 60s that the major expansion of the railroad takes place in India. So by the 1900s, you're in a different world. Underground uh, coal plants have opened up. The railways uh, span over 50,000 50, kilometers. And so the entire transport networks, which link South Asia to the world, have undergone a substantial and irrevocable change. 1867 is the opening of the Suez Canal. Uh, in the 1860s, you have the coming of the telegraph. And uh, just to illustrate, my former supervisor, Tapan Rai Chaudhary, has written somewhere that 10,000 pack pull-ups walking in a straight line, the amount of merchandise they could carry could be carried by a goods train. And the goods train could traverse in a matter of days the distance that these pack pull-ups would take uh, for over six months. So this quickening of the pace of transport and communication would have immense ecological consequences. And one of the significant uh, dimensions which has emerged, of course, and which has huge environmental significance, is the huge amount of out-migration that came about in the period of empire. We're living through a period uh, when the term Black Lives Matter means something everywhere. We learn a lot about the history of slavery, rightfully so. Uh, but uh, even after the abolition of slavery in 1833, there was indentured labor, and huge amounts of people were taken from southern and central India to the tea plantations in another part of India, to Assam, but much more importantly, to Mauritius, to Fiji, uh, 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 to the rubber plantations, which would come up in the 20th century in Malaya. And Sunil Amrit's work, Crossing the Bay of Bengal, links the environmental history of South and Southeast Asia through the movement of these peoples. He also shows that one cannot look at the future of the Indian Ocean, the Northern Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, without taking into account the interests of these different countries of South and Southeast Asia. So just to illustrate, if you look at horses, elephants, and peoples, their movements and the pattern of their movements has changed very significantly. We can't think of life in any one of these nation states without thinking of the other. This emerges very well in the work of ecologists. My distinguished colleague, Dr. Divya Karnad, has recently won an award for her work on shark fisheries. And as you know, many of the shark species in the Indian Ocean, the Western Indian Ocean, are today endangered. And uh, one of the things she shows is that uh, the driver of uh, shark decline is not just shark fin soup, which is an export item uh, to countries such as Japan, but the demand for shark meat in the Gulf and within India and other parts of South Asia itself. And uh, this, of course, uh, uh, transforms an age-old practice of shark fishing, but monetizes it and transforms sharks of all ages into a commodity for meat to an extent that they never were earlier. It's not that people weren't catching and eating sharks or catching, processing, and selling them. But the scale is of a new variety. Arthur and Lobo in another fascinating paper show that uh, trawlers are not only taking away the fish that they intend to, they're taking away bycatch. Huge numbers of fish and fingerlings found in the ocean bed. And much of this bycatch, since it's not consumed by humans, is uh, now consumed by chickens. So the price of broiler chicken in many parts of South Asia has come down because they're being fed with bycatch. But the bycatch is being caught from the ocean floor. So there's a net transfer of nitrogen from the ocean floor to the uh, mainland, to the terrestrial uh, ecological system. But there's also a huge destruction of the entire marine ecological system. What does this do to the discipline of history? One of the points it does, and this is brought out very well in the work of a leading environmental historian of the world, John McNeil. John McNeil wrote a marvelous book called Mosquito Empires. Uh, and in the beginning of the book, he tells us that the origins of the book, believe it or not, were over a lunchtime conversation with Richard Grove, who wandered into his office. And McNeil has argued that environmental history has to be a history of humans, but history of humans in interaction with their wider environment. The environment in the widest sense, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the various species, the living taxa, that share this planet with us. To write this history requires a knowledge of more than just history. And Grove, of course, was uniquely qualified for this. I want to end with this. He studied geography. He was schooled in Ghana. He studied geography at Hartford College in Oxford. He went on to study conservation biology in the University of London. And he did a PhD, of course, in history. He served in various departments. But I think he was, in one sense, a polymath. Uh, he did not see boundaries between nation states, or for that matter, boundaries between ecological systems. Or boundaries between it is unlikely 
that there will be many scholars, even in an audience as distinguished as this one, who will equal his polymath sort of skills. But I do think the spirit of growth must live within each of us. It must live because the history of ideas and of practice cannot possibly be delinked, because we need to allow evidence to question what we think intuitively to be true. And we need to ask in this very troubled age of ours, when we think of issues such as species extinction, climate change, global nuclear conflagration, the spread of uh, viruses or microbes which may harm uh, human lives as the Spanish flu did at the end of the First World War, plague did in the 1890s on in five great waves, COVID-19 does today. In this age, it is very important to remember that history as a discipline has great significance. Grove was very clear about something which he never spelled out, but which is implicit in his many uh, papers and articles, his talks, uh, his books, which is that history doesn't offer lessons but it gives insights. And one of its great insights is that the search for peace among people has to be underpinned by a search for peace with nature. How we define peace will of course always be contentious, but it is more than the absence of war. And in this sense, Richard Grove in his work, beginning in the 80s and right until um, uh, his, he left us a few weeks ago, most tragically, gave us a trail, which I'm sure we'll all be inspired to follow. I'm very sorry I got cut off in the middle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mahesh, for a really meaningful and thoughtful celebration of Richard Grove's work. And we are privileged to have you speak here uh, to us uh, about what Richard Grove's work did for the discipline of history, but also how, in a way, you know, laid foundations for the kind of work that, we, uh, that you know, uh, future generations are carrying out. Um, uh, we are, I think, also privileged to have Vinita in the audience uh, this evening. So thank you, Vinita, for joining us as well. Uh, Vinita Damodaran, uh, who spoke last week about the uh, plant geneticist Janaki Ammal, uh, has been Richard Grove's partner and a uh, rock uh, of strength uh, in his career and his life. So it's a privilege to also have you. I think it is, to my mind, a fitting closure to an exhibition and to a project that is Science Gallery Bangalore, which attempts to bring together people across disciplines, people across careers, people across professions to think together, not very dissimilar to the way in, in which you close the discussion, uh, Mahesh, which is you know, that, that a, a, a goal uh, that, that is uh, worthy of having is one of peace. And if, if that has to be accomplished, then in, in many ways, it has to be accomplished in negotiation with, our, with nature, but also, you know, in a way, reimagining our relationship to nature at all. Allow me to present to you, Mahesh, questions from our audiences. Um, so we have, uh, are you with us, Mahesh? And can you hear me? Mahesh seems to have dropped off there he is. Ah, he's yes 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 so mahesh i'm going to i'm going to relay to you questions from our audience uh, so the first question is from prashant who he says he's thinking aloud the idea of greening as a phrase for planting at scale is as problematic as deforestation so he says he sometimes winces when he sees that the idea of desert scrub down shown as the consequences of environmental degradation even if they are, the wider message tends to portray these habitats themselves as undesirable and focus policy action on greening deserts. So this is something, you know, that also connects to uh, the fascinating talk that Pradeep Krishan gave at the start of Phytopia on the first day of Phytopia. So I guess it's nice to kind of come full circle to this. Mahesh, uh, what would be your thoughts on that? No, as a student of history, uh, uh, I'll quote, uh, the great Dr. Marx, who was trained in philosophy, when asked his, by his daughters in a Victorian parlor game what his maxim was, he said, doubt everything. Of course, uh, there's a famous uh, uh, his, uh, historian of India's forest, who was a forester, inspector general of forests, called E.P. Stebbing. And he wrote an absolutely scary book in the 1930s about the Sahara and how the sands of the Sahara were going to advance and engulf the rest of the countries of Africa. And it's been shown a lot of this was uh, alarmism. It's not that Stebbing was telling lies, but he was being an alarmist. 
And there's no doubt at all in the Indian case that the silvicultural traditions of the forest department have led to planting up of very important grasslands. We know now from the work of uh, John Richards, historical work, and the very important ecological work of Dr. Jayashree Ratnam, that savannas probably were much more widespread in what is now South Asia. Probably 20% of the land was tree-covered savanna as late as the 1880s. So Prashant, I'm completely with you. I want to emphasize green imperialism in Richard Grove's case should be in quotes. So greening, just as deforestation, is a problematized concept. We should doubt these, ask the context in which they're being applied, and question them. Thank you. It's an excellent question. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, we have Pradeep, a question from Pradeep as well. Uh, we, of course, had, had, a, had a note of thanks from Vinita to you, Mahesh, for, uh, for a lovely lecture. Uh, Pradeep um, wants to ask you if, you're, if you would share with us your perspective on the conflict between Richard and Ram Guha. What was all that? What was that all about? And what were the issues at stake? Uh, you know, when I set out to write my thesis, I had to do this, and I wrote all sorts of things. And I had a college supervisor. I had a college where they weren't happy with having one gamekeeper. They had two. The college supervisor was supposed to be someone who knew nothing about what you were doing. He was a Latin American uh, scholar, Lawrence Whitehead, and he said something very nice to me. He said, you know, you should like these guys and respect them, but don't be reverential. I think there's a difference also to do with the kind of sources they used and what they were studying. Guha set out to study the peasant movement in Uttarakhand. And in studying forestry, he asked what motivated the foresters? What did they do to the forest? And he looked at one particular place, Uttarakhand. And on the late 19th century, uh, Guha is undoubtedly a very important scholar. There are many criticisms of him, but he's critical. And Grove's strength is the early 19th century. He's looking at a very different kind of polity. And there's a lot of work being done on the East India Company. And uh, it's much more fluid than we now think. And one of the reasons for the fluidity is that they did administration on the cheap. So Gibson, Watson, Cleghorn, such big figures in Grove's work, each had 10, 12, 15 men under them. And remember, they were administering areas which are equal to two, three, four Indian states today. So I think the difference is of perspective, and it comes from their sources. Uh, the other is very interesting. Guha, as you know, went forwards. So he ended up writing a Life of Elwin. He wrote A History of India after 47. He's written on Nehru. Grove is a rare historian. He went backwards in time. He started with 1860, but he kept going back to 1791. And believe it or not, he knew things which happened hundreds and thousands of years ago. So you will find references to Theophrastus and several others. So it's a difference of perspective. And I think it's very rich. That's what history is about. It's not one tale. It depends where you begin the story, how you tell it, and what you're trying to tell. And each historian tells his or her own story. Yeah. So I have Vijay Ramesh here, who... Uh, of course, thanks you for the wonderful talk. And he says, you mentioned work by Hugh Cleghorn on deforestation and was wondering why it was significant at the time and you know what might have been uh, worthwhile noticing. Difficult to sum up in a line, but I think Grove shows Cleghorn is a man of many parts. He learned several Indian languages. Uh, hmm. His uh, interests were much more than horticulture. They extended to organisms, they extended to disease. And he was among the early people to draw links between denudation or the clearing of forest and uh, changes in terms of what today we would call, you know, soil erosion, hydrology, the larger plant life. He was also important because he did a lot of exploration for economic reasons. So among the finest reports in Ram Guha sort of country on uh, pine and uh, conifer resources of, Uttar, of Barbal Kumar is by Kegon. And I would urge you to just go and look at his book, Forests and Gardens of South India. I'm sure it's available on the web. And there's no copyright. And I think what Richard reminds us is that observers are important. If you know how to read them, you can learn a lot about their times. And we must emphasize some of these surgeon botanists were marginal in the larger picture. And in the 1860s and 50s, eventually they got pretty marginalized. But some ideas they gave, like desiccation, it keeps coming back in official and non-official debate all the time. So their ideas outlive them. Right or wrong. So Mahesh, uh, a couple of things. So just reminding our audiences, this is your last chance to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box provided. Um, one question that I have for you is, where do you see the horizons for environmental history today, especially in the context of South Asia? So what, what do you see are the key questions that have emerged? Uh, you know, 
sort of, I mean, uh, you have, of course, been an incredibly important uh, historian, um, you know, who laid, who laid foundations for uh, this work as well. And there are younger scholars today. So where do you see this going and where, what do you see are sort of, you know, the, the key questions that are emerging at this moment? And what, in a sense, what do you think is missing? And what do you think needs to be brought back in? Of course, that's difficult. You know, one nice way is to take refuge behind recent works. And uh, my colleague has written a book, uh, Pratyanath, called Climates of Conquest. And it's about war, state, and society in uh, the Mughal period. And one of the fascinating things is the enormous importance of the environment in war. He looks at Assam and he looks at uh, the areas which are northwest frontier Afghanistan and why the Mughals had such a tough time conquering them. And there are elephants, there are rivers, there's water, there are horses, there's climate. Uh, he has a fascinating chapter on the snows of Kabul and how they ruined the life of many Mughal generals, including some very ambitious princes. So I think this larger complexity of the relationships of war making state and society. There's fascinating work now on rivers. I think one of the most significant books to come out in a long time is a long-term history of the Brahmaputra by Saikya, an unquiet river. But it's only one of the works on rivers. There's Gilmartin and the Indus. There's a superb book on the Ganges water machine. Uh, so rivers, war state and society, and very significant works on the city. Uh, some of the uh, very uh, insightful works on Chennai and Mumbai, how these have developed. Uh, you know, Devjani Bhattacharya's work on Kolkata. So I think the longer uh, term histories, to me, there are two fascinating questions. One, how is it there are certain landscapes and waterscapes which have remained productive and habitable over centuries, despite or perhaps because of the presence of humans? So are humans not just destroyers, but also reinventors and builders? Of course, there are different kinds and sets of humans. The other, uh, to what extent do non-human entities, are they possessed of agency? So my interest, of course, was on lions, but I think there's very interesting insights in interspecies histories on elephants. But when I'm asked these questions, I think there are many horizons, there are many exciting questions, and a lot of them will come through fieldwork, a lot will come with engagements with both written and oral sources. There's nothing as rich as a society as diverse as this one. So I would say the horizons are limitless. Hmm. That's actually fantastic to hear. Um, there are a couple more questions. Uh, one, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'll, I'll let you decide your comfort at answering them. Um, one of them talks about the reforms of 1991 and what, as, what, do you, what is your perspective as a historian on the ability to keep a balance between economic growth or development as it has been called and the environment? This is sort of a, you know, a, a question that has come up again and again. Um, you know, at least in the public domain. Um, so your view on it? You know, three of us did an issue of seminar in uh, 2017. We're doing it as a book, Nature's Present. And yep. uh, Ravi Agawal, photographer, works a lot on rivers. Uh, Rinki Sarkar, 30 years of work on regenerating forests in Uttarakhand. And our argument was that uh, in the last 50 years, independent India developed its own legislative executive community frameworks, which were trying to achieve the balance. But the epochal changes and shifts unleashed, not just by 91, but 91 as a metaphor. Some of the changes of 91 can be traced back into the 80s. Some, of course, came later. Some are unfolding today. If one were to use this larger process of market-friendly reforms, there are two huge changes which are struck, struck by as a historian. From the Second World War to the 80s, 90s, we had a developmental state. The state was seen as the driver of investment. Now, it is seen as the facilitator of investment. So there's a fundamental shift in its character and nature. The other, the changes being unleashed in this period, particularly the last 25 years and the coming 25 years, are epochal in nature. So much of the debate in environmental history is about biomass. It's about trees, plants, animals, fish. Sometimes it's about water. Please consider the huge transformations of infrastructure, docks, ports, harbors, pipelines, mines, townships. These... Uh, linear changes. These are huge. These, this is a kind of uh, remaking the earth. It's epochal. And it's particularly significant because it's happening in a land of sharply defined wet and dry seasons, where biomass production actually in much of India is highly efficient, but only given sufficient sunlight, moisture, and conditions where the, re where the regeneration is possible. So is this a tear of the landscape permanently, or is it a remaking of the landscape? depends where you stand. 
And I think it's a very epochal point. And one of the things we try to do is we've got together people who are thinking about it in new ways. So wait for the book. Wonderful. Uh, so th this was Raj Shekhar. I, I, I imagine you're satisfied with the answer because I certainly am. Uh, we have here uh, an anthropologist, Nayanika Mathur, who wants to ask you how you see environmental history intersecting with anthropology when it comes to specifically the question of climate crisis. I wish I knew. I don't know what the answers are, but well, one of the things which you're struck by is that there are so many itinerant forms of production, or itinerant forms of settlement, uh, which have probably the propensity and ability to deal with climatic shifts. And we're living in a period when many of these are being obliterated or being rendered irrelevant or effectively being wiped off the map. Not so different from the savanna planted up with prosopis or acacia or a or ecroformis or water. And uh, certainly documenting them, engaging with them would be vital. The other is to try and ask, and I think anthropologists are very good at this, um, these different ways of living, do they also entail different ways of seeing? Seeing the landscape, the cycle of the seasons, different organisms, different waste materials. And uh, I'm not sure historians are very good at this because remember we are often constrained by the nature of our sources. I would, of course, uh, argue that archaeologists have a lot to teach us. And one of the advantages in a department where there are very good people working on prehistory is that you start realizing some of these are not always new challenges. So I think this interface of living things, inanimate objects, and extant cultures is something history can enormously benefit from. And I, I, I must say with great humility that students of history who worked on forestry, game, and water in the 80s and 90s, when it was still a new area, the, the obvious people we gravitated to were anthropologists. Everybody else said, oh, you're working in shifting cultivation? Uh, did they obliterate it by beating them up? Or did they simply buy them out? And you'd say, no, 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 it's not so simple. Ah, you want to preserve it. They'd say, wash you know, rubbing their hands. And feet. So I think anthropology and history have a very productive dialogue. And this tapestry of life around us, which biologists celebrate, uh, we, we need to learn about it in a critical manner. So critical anthropology and critical history have a lot to learn from each other and to dialogue with the ecological sciences. So I see this as a triptych of a dialogue. Wonderful. Um, Nishant Kumar, if I understand, is a political scientist who would like to ask you if, how do you see environmental history changing in the information age? I'm a living fossil of the analog age, and I look to younger people to tell me the answers. I honestly don't know. Okay. Okay, uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll end this and I'll ask you the last question from Fazal Rashid, who has a, who has a left of field question to a historian. Uh, but, I, but I imagine you might be able to still, you know, guide him on, on some fronts at least. What, what he says is that he would like not to become only an academic, but also a practitioner who is involved in ecological restor restoration. So in India, what kind of institutions, places, or training, or activities would you direct him to? Look for people who are in the field. Uh, each of us has our picks. I think there are people trying to regrow rainforests, just to give you an instance. There's fascinating uh, ecological restoration going on in and around the city of Delhi and in Gurgaon, uh, with wetlands, with scrub forest. And uh, my sense is, and uh, many people who work on grasslands and on different forms of shifting cultivation will tell you that there are other forms of restoration done by people themselves. They don't call it that. So there are many institutions. Please be in touch. I'm very easy to contact. You can reach me through the university mail, mahesh.trangarajan at ashoka.edu.in. If that's too complicated and long-winded, my name is long-winded enough, but uh, you can put my surname, rangarajan.mahesh at gmail.com. I'm more than happy to help get you in touch with the few people I know, and I'm sure that there are many others here in this room. And uh, I think that's a very good question. How can we engage with real life issues? And I think restoration in a broad sense is a very important uh, element. Uh, there's a very nice book you may want to read, Bahar Dutt, Rewilding. Uh, it's got lots of interesting anecdotes and stories. It's also got names at the end. You may want to reach out to some of those people. Everything from fish to tigers to birds. That's very generous of you, Mahesh, as I've always known you. So 
allow me to thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening and to bring Phytopia to a stellar close as we imagined it would be. I just have a brief thank you note now for Mahesh, but also for others who have made Phytopia possible. Uh, I didn't imagine I would use a cliche of this kind, but I still must. It's with a heavy heart that I bring Phytopia to a close, which has primarily taken shape online. My entire team is working from home. We haven't met in over five months, but we've worked and we've done our best. We hope you've enjoyed it and we seek your support, your feedback. So please do give us your feedback so that we can better our efforts as we go ahead and establish what we think is a public institution for deep research-based engagement in the human and natural sciences, engineering, and art. My first thank you is to the government of Karnataka who have supported and put faith in us time and again in the development of this new institution and who stand rock solid behind us in our effort to create a public engagement institution that this city, but this country also deserves. I'd like to thank again Ralph Lopian, the chairperson of the Committee on United Nations International Year of Plant Health for taking the time to be with us this evening. I thank our content partners, the John Innes Center and the Kasturbhai Lalbhai Museum. I'd also like to thank Marg Magazine, Entene Magazine and the Royal Society Archives for allowing us to use materials in this exhibition and they are on display. I'm very happy to thank our program partners, the Bangalore Sustainability Forum and the Natural History Museum of London, especially Brad Irwin, for making a collaboration possible. And we were lucky to have Sandy Knapp, the chairperson of the Linnaean Society, take us through the botanical illustrations on the absolutely fascinating Natural History Museum building. Our outreach partner, who are responsible for this evening as well, Bangalore International Center, we are very, very happy to work with you and look forward to continuing our collaboration in the future. Academic advisors to this exhibition, Harini Nagendra, Shannon Olson, and Sita Reddy, without your enthusiastic support, we wouldn't have been able to make this possible. So thank you again so much for your, for your happy engagement with us and for keeping us also um, on our toes. For those of you who have been lucky to attend a mediated session in our exhibitions, which is basically where we have our mediators, which is young adults, take you through the exhibition over a Zoom call or a Google Meets call, will know what I'm talking about when I say our mediators are the soul of the gallery. They are the ones you meet first, they are the ones who mediate our content, and they are the ones who make and bring to life and animate the effort that goes into making an exhibition. Without them, all of this effort in a way would not have a face. So please allow me to thank Arushi, Bevan, Bina, Govin, Janavi, Jay, Manasvi, Meghna, Misha, Rishan, Parthivan, Srivrishank, Vinay, Yamini, for all the time and effort that you put into this and for the joy that you bring to each of our visitors. I remain grateful to our partner institutions, the Indian Institute of Science, the National Center for Biological Sciences, and Trishti for their continuing support to make this institution possible. Of course, I am grateful to the facilitators, speakers, filmmakers, and artists who have populated the exhibition and the equally important programming that has happened through this entire period of 10 days. Last but not least, I'm very happy to have an absolutely fantastic team that I can work with, people who I can share my joys and frustrations with, and the team that makes this exhibition and other things for this institution possible. Thank you again for taking the time to be with us this evening. Hope you join us in our next exhibition, which is Contagion, and it launches in December this year, sometime in later December this year. We hope to see many of you join us at that point of time as well. Thank you. And good night.